Hello, and welcome to the Instagram Live for today. We're going to be having a discussion about the neuroscience of respiration. And in a couple moments, Professor Jack Feldman is going to join us. So I'm just going to take a couple moments to just welcome everybody. I'm looking forward to today's discussion. We'll get a few requests coming through, and then I'm going to invite Jack in. Uh, so this is always the unusual pause portion of the of the program, so to speak. But delighted to see some names I recognize and, and a lot of new names. Hi, Daisy. I haven't seen you in a long time. Hope all is well on the East Coast. Are there, I see some other names coming through. I'm trying to keep an eye out for Jack. Um, hello, folks. Today we're going to be talking about the neuroscience of respiration and breathing. And Jack is really a, if not the world expert in respiration and breathing and the neuroscience of respiration and breathing. I'm imagining he's going to log on here in a moment. Um, and when he does, he's going to ha have a conversation. So Jack, you can, rec I see that you're here. Great. Jack, you're going to want to request to be, to join. So there should be a, um, a little tab will pop up on your screen that says request to be to join the live. And when, when you do that, I'll see the notification and then um, you'll be in. So I saw him pass by literally like a ship at the bottom of my screen. So, okay, folks, so this is, is great. So, oh, wow, all the way from Greece, wonderful. Okay, I see the request now. Jack, I'm gonna add you now. Hi, Andrew. And there he is, wonderful. Um, Jack, great to see you again. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Terrific. So um, this is Jack's first time doing this format. Let's hope my internet connection and his stays intact. Um, if it doesn't, we'll just iterate and move on. And we'll just, if you happen to get bumped off, you can just come right back in and request again. It's the same process. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, this will be recorded for those of you that are concerned that you won't get to see all of it although it'd be wonderful if you were here. I will field questions at some point. Um, there's a questions tab at the bottom, a little question mark. That's really the best place. Hi, Ben Pukulski. Uh, that's, that's probably the best place to ask questions because your questions otherwise just stream right past um, literal stream of consciousness, but collective, it would be the stream of collective consciousness, literally. Um, anyway, from Hawaii, Algeria. Wow, we have people from all over the world. This is wonderful. So Jack, um, Let's get started. Um, I was just about to introduce you, but now I'll do it properly. Jack is, in my mind and in the minds of, I would say, all neuroscientists, if you were to say, who is the world expert on the neuroscience brain control over respiration and breathing? It's the man that you see below me on your screen, but he does not occupy any place below <laughs> anybody. He occupies the place at the top of the, the ladder in terms of breathing apparatus in the brain. So just briefly, uh, I want to highlight uh, two important um, things about his discoveries because we don't have time to get into everything. But um, Jack is credited with the discovery of a structure in the brain called the pre-Botzinger complex, which is controls rhythmic breathing where inhales precede exhales, precede inhales, precede exhales. Um, So-called rhythmic breathing. It was named after a bottle of wine. He was very gracious to name it after a bottle of wine and not after himself, like uh, his ego is in check. And um, so the Botzinger is a wine and you all have pre-Botzinger areas in your brain that control rhythmic breathing. Uh, as I described in a previous post, I'm just trying to get people up to speed so that we don't have to do too much background. He has also done extensive work on the parafacial nucleus, which is also in the brainstem. Um, neurons there, nerve cells control non-rhythmic breathing and some other aspects of breathing. So the first thing I want to um, ask you, Jack, well, first of all, welcome. Um, Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. And I'd love to get your take on these two structures in the brain. I said one controls rhythmic breathing. The other one controls breathing that's integrated with speech and things like that. I'd love for you to just tell us if there is something that we should also know about these structures that you would like people in the world to know about how they work or what they do that you find particularly important and interesting, that would be wonderful 
um, to share. If not, we can just move to the next topic. But is there anything that you really think people should know about these two brain areas that they have? Aside well, from I, 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 I think that we can look at the pre complex as sort of as you would an engine in the car. It's the thing that propels the whole process forward. Now, an engine alone is not going to get the car moving forward. The engine has to be connected through a transmission. Ultimately, the tires have to rotate. So there's lots of things that are involved in getting the uh, chest wall to move in order for your lungs to expand and get air to move in and out of your lungs. But at the heart of it is this engine. That's the pre complex. Now, it turns out we not only have an engine... Could I ask you one question about the pre this thing, the engine, the pre-Butzinger engine? Sure. Are there direct connections from the pre-Butzinger complex to the diaphragm and and rib walls that allow me to move my lungs? Or no, no, it goes to an intermediate uh, relay or at least one or two neurons before it gets there. So it's not a direct connection. Remember, you have lots of different muscles that are driving breathing. It's not just the diaphragm. You have muscles in your rib cage. You have muscles in the upper airway. And those have to be controlled uh, somewhat independently. So the pre complex is giving the basic signal that it's time to inspire. But you need a lot of other inputs in order to make sure that that's coordinated properly, depending on your body posture, your activity level, and uh, your state of uh, awareness. Okay. So one, I just want to, um, because we've got people from all over the world, when Jack says inspire, he means inhale. Um, okay. just, uh, just to be clear. Yeah, because I think we've got probably, I'm guessing by the end, uh, Argentina, great, my regional homeland. We uh, probably have um, 12 or more countries here that are logging in. That's great. So, and then how should I think about the parafacial nucleus? I talk about it as where we have double inhales or double exhales coordinated with breathing, but you've alluded to something really interesting recently in a discussion we had, which was that maybe neurons there are also controlling things like laughing, coughing, kind of, is, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, working with your Stanford colleague, Mark Krasner and uh, uh, Kevin Yackel, we showed that there are structures around the facial nucleus, which we call parafacial, that are critical for sighing. And sighing is, is considered can be divided into two parts. There's a part where we're sighing every five minutes, and we need to do that to keep the lung functioning properly. And they're the size that we generate typically when we're under stress or uh, in some sort of emotional, there's high emotional valence. And we take these deep breaths. And we, we know what the physiological size are for there to maintain lung health. The reason we sigh during emotional stress may be something that hopefully we get into in discussion later. And that is how breathing can interact with emotional state. Mm, okay. Um, someone's telling me there's an echo. Thank you. Unfortunately, I'm plugged into power. So if I, I'll, I'll get headphones if that makes it better. Jack, you're okay. Um, if there, if the echo continues, please let me know in the comments below. Um, and people are saying there's background noise. There's a sound problem. Okay. Well, this is. Uh, let's see. What we I could take out my earphones. Maybe it's my earphones that are doing. Sometimes the. Hold on. Let me... Can, can people hear can us? Okay. Now? I can hear you just fine. You. Hold on. All right. People are saying no echo. So it could be on the receiving end. I did see someone in Antarctica. And if that is true, that is amazing and awesome. Um, Jack's going to get coordinated again with us here. We do want the sound to come through. These Instagram lives are, um, are, are a little bit of an iteration process. Okay. Sound sounds okay here. Jack, you want to come back? Oh, I hope we didn't lose him as a consequence of that. He'll come back. So there are these two complex which controls these rhythmic breathing. So Jack will have to log back in. It looks like he got bumped off. So pre singer is controlling things like at any rate, doesn't matter if it's, here he comes. Jack, you have to, uh, you declined my, the, the invitation. Um, so at breathing at any rate is, is going to be, thank you for the comments about the sound. Sorry, folks, this is, a, well, at least we have the hour. Jack, you're gonna need to request to come back in. Um, wonderful, so let me see here if, here if he's coming in, there is no, So 
someone's apologizing. It's okay. Sorry All right. about that. No, no, John, it's okay. We, it's important. We have the hour, so we're going to get this right. And folks, whatever we don't cover today, we will do these again. But um, okay, so we talked about pre butt singer, and it's involved in inspiration and, and exhalation, um, rhythmic breathing. No, no, the, I didn't get to finish the parafacial. The parafacial seems to be an independent oscillator that generate expiratory movements. So oh, wait, 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 wait. So that, say, that's, wait, wait, could you slow that down? Independent oscillator to generate expiratory movement. So we've got people coming with a variety of backgrounds. So what, what do you mean exactly? Okay, so it used to, we used to think that there was one unified oscillator that generated inspiratory efforts to move air in and expiratory efforts to move air out. And uh, we've discovered that there was a structure around the parafacial, around the facial nucleus in the parafacial region that seemed to be an independent oscillator that generated expiration. The trick was that under normal condition, we actively inspire, but we passively expire. So we don't need this second oscillator. So one of the reasons we never saw it is that in the experimental conditions we were working, it was never turned on. And then we discovered under certain manipulations we made in the lab that this oscillator got turned on. And then we followed it up and it really does look like there's this second oscillator. So when you're sitting here, we're sitting here, we're mostly actively inspiring, passively expiring. Now for you and I to speak, we have to actively push air out of our airways. But for normal just breathing, to generate that active expiration, we have to turn on this oscillator. So when you go and exercise and you have to start moving more air in and out of your lung to get more oxygen in and more carbon dioxide out, you turn on this second oscillator. And that was actually quite a surprise to find that. Okay, so very interesting. So what Jack's describing is when he talks about oscillators is, you know, you have, it's, it's almost like a gear system that generates that the system so that it goes inhale, exhale. He's calling them inspire and expire. I call them inhale, exhale. Those are the same. Inhale is inspire, exhale is expire. So those are the same thing when we're referring to those. So, um, so we have these two breathing centers. I know there are a lot of people that are really interested in what they can do in terms of using breathing to modify brain states. And we're going to get to that and whether or not the specific pattern of breathing makes a difference or not and how it might. But before we do that, I, you've done some really interesting work and you have some interesting thoughts about how breathing and emotions are related to one another. So could you um, talk about the relationship between respiration and breathing, these brain centers and emotion? Okay. I'd be delighted to. So it, it, if we step back a little bit, um, the brain, the brain itself has lots of areas that are devoted to very specific functions. We have vision, we have hearing, we have smell. And yet when we perceive the world, we perceive it as a unified whole. So one of the things that when, as the brain evolved was to make sure that these signals coming from disparate area were properly coordinated. And the coordination in the brain involving the convergence of signals from these areas has to be very precise time-wise, just within a few milliseconds. If the signals are slightly off, they take on, take on quite a bit uh, different meaning. And so the way the brain seems to have solved this problem is by having uh, background oscillations. And with these background oscillations, the signals tend to be on the for example, the peak of the oscillations instead of on the trough. So that makes sure that the signals are sort of regimented. So they come in in line. Now we have these oscillations over many different frequencies in the brain. How, but the slowest one is breathing. So most of the oscillations are a few times per second. In humans, breathing is every five, six seconds. So it's a very slow oscillation. And yet, over the past five to 10 years, breathing oscillations have been discovered throughout the entire brain. And when you remove them experimentally, it seems to disturb various aspects of brain function. Mm. Um, okay. So what you're so saying, so just to, I want to make sure I summarize for folks because um, people are logging in and logging off. So what you're saying is that these oscillations, these rhythms in breathing are represented in the brain and at numerous places. And that they're also, that they're, when they're 
disrupted, a lot of other brain areas change the way they function. Is that right? Right. And not necessarily in a, in a way that's beneficial. Okay. The, under no, normal conditions, the signals come in because they're the riding on this background wave. When the wave gets disturbed, that will d alter the way that the brain processes information. And in fact, we can take advantage of that because of all these oscillations, the only oscillation we have volitional control over, voluntary control over, is breathing. And it looks like when we slow breathing down through any of a variety of ways, it can have a positive effect on both emotion and cognitive function. Okay, so um, you said some really important things right there that I want to highlight. Um, so I recall you saying that of all the rhythms in our nervous system, one, at least one of them, but probably the one that we know we can have voluntary control over is this respiration rhythm. And before that, you said that there are all these brain areas, actually areas of the brain and body, nervous system, which includes brain and body, of course, that are controlled by these respiratory oscillations. And so, and then I heard you say, slowing down the oscillation, that just the, the mere act of slowing it down can be beneficial for a variety of other circuits in the brain and body. Is that Correct. right? That's my okay. idea. Okay. I this just want to make sure I'm getting something. this correct. And, yeah. and I know folks um, are telling me to turn off the comments. If I tamper with the screen or do anything, chances are this, the feed will be delayed or slowed even further. So um, we love the comments. Keep them coming if you like. If you don't like the comments, you can hold your hand just below Jack's chin and they'll disappear. It's, uh, it's, uh, I'm, t I'm teasing, but I really, if I touch the screen, um, it's going to be dreadful. So I'm sorry. I don't want to um, kick us off. Okay. So I know it's slowing it down, but I, there's really no way to do this instantaneously. I'm so sorry. Um, okay. So continuing on about the, re the relationship between breathing and uh, emotion. So slowing down breathing can be positive. What other aspects of changing breathing pattern? Or I think of the, the, the um, amplitude of breathing, like shallow breathing versus deep breathing. What, what's going on about that? Well, I, I think it's, uh, I, we're not really prepared to uh, sort of separate those two things. We're, right now, I think about it sort of the way that we think about exercise and health. That is, if you're sedentary, it's not good. And any form of exercise, from walking to running and whatnot, is much better than being sedentary. Now, when you get beyond that, there are all these different ways you can choose to exercise. And uh, some may be more optimal for particular goals with your uh, physical well-being or your training. Uh, and others may be just because you like doing it. Uh, the important thing is to exercise. And I think with respect to uh, what aspect of breathing is going to have the most profound effect, at this point, I'm not prepared to, to uh, differentiate. What I will say is that many different kinds of breathing patterns seem to have a positive effect. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason being is that it comes down to changing the frequency, slowing it down, changing the amplitude, disturbs these, uh, this equilibrium in the way these, if the information is normally processed in the brain. And it changes in a way that seems to be beneficial. And it happens over different time scales. You know, you are, you're nervous, you're about to perform, or you're about to come on uh, someone's Instagram TV. You take a deep breath, and maybe you take two deep breaths, and that turns out to be relaxing. You know, even lower your blood pressure. Um, on the other hand, regular meditation uh, can have a profound effect on uh, states like depression. You can, people who practice meditation, many people find it very effective in treating their depression to do these breathing exercises. Yeah. Um, so Jack's making a really important point that I think for, at least for the Instagram crowd, might come as a bit of a surprise but it's one that I also subscribe to, and it's the basis of some experiments going on in humans in my lab right now. Mo motivated, I almost said inspired, but I don't want to confuse people, motivated by uh, Jack's work. Um, so there's an idea that particular kinds of breathing, maybe lots of inhales or lots of exhales or big amplitude or low amplitude, is going to 
direct the brain into particular states. You see that out in the world, right? But what I heard you say and what you and I have discussed offline, so in fairness, we've talked about this a little bit uh, before, it's possible that merely changing the pattern of breathing, so just by deliberately changing the pattern of breathing, it shifts the pattern of whatever's going on in your brain, whatever emotions or moods or thoughts in some way that gets you out of that pattern or t temporarily disrupts that pattern. And that the actual specific pattern of breathing that you do might be secondarily or less important or maybe not even important at all. Although I, I would say that um, I, I lean towards the possibility that it might be less important. So in other words, the question is, is it, just changing the way you breathe could very well change the way that you, your brain is working and your mood and your body is working because of these extensive connections. And the specific pattern of breathing that you use to shift it may not matter as much as that there's a shift per se. Um, I, I can, yeah, that's pretty much the, uh, how I think about it. Uh, I don't mean to be dogmatic. I just mean to be ecumenical in terms of, you know, that basically these slow, deep breathing patterns seem to be very, very effective. Um, my way of thinking about this is, suppose we take a serious problem like depression. Um, and we could think of depression in neural terms as activity going around a connected group of neurons. And it sort of goes around and around in a circle. Now, we have this phenomena in the brain, which, Andrew, you are well familiar with, where neurons can strengthen their connection if they're coactive. And so what, what I think you can, um, you can model depression as these connections get so strong because they're going around in this loop over and over again that uh, they're, you just can't get out of it. The, sort of the analogy is if you walked around in a circle on uh, uh, dirt, eventually you would produce a rut. And you keep walking and walking, and the rut gets deeper and deeper to the point the rut is so deep you can't get out of it. Now the question is, what can we do when you're in that deep rut? Well, we know that um, uh, electroconvulsive therapy seems to be effective. And electric shock there, therapy. Electric shock therapy. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing there is you're disrupting that circuit. And when you disrupt that circuit, one of the things that the nervous system can do is weaken the connections. So just as the nervous system can strengthen connections, it weakens connections. You do it often enough, it's like putting dirt in your rut, and the rut becomes more shallow and more shallow. Now, that's pretty heroic to do electric shock. But you can do uh, deep brain stimulation, which is putting wires into particular regions of the brain and just stimulate those regions of the brain. And neurosurgeons do this in very special cases and it seems to be effective. I think that breathing has the same effect. It's not quite as dramatic, but what you're doing is you're disrupting the activity going around in this depressive loop. And if you uh, meditate on a regular basis or slow breathe or do whatever breathing exercises you're doing, what's going to happen is those connections are going to weaken. And as over time, they're going to get so weak that now you're beginning to lift out of your depressive uh, state. I love this. So, so folks, too, um, you can tell I'm kind of summarizing um, just to make sure I understand and that you understand. Um, so Jack beautifully described how really neuroplasticity, how we get these kind of uh, how what these thought reflexes that when sometimes can be depressive, thinking the same thing over and over, we get caught. He described it as creating a, a, a rut. You know, actually, my dog always walks in the same little corner in, the, in there and there's, it's a trench because he's, he's heavy. Um, and what he described and to shift out of that pattern, you need to do something differently. And what I love is that you described two very invasive, pretty dramatic um, depression treatments, both of which have been shown to work, uh, or three maybe, tr transcranial magnetic stimulation, deep brain stimulation where a wire is lowered beneath, beneath the skull by a neurosurgeon, and electric shock therapy where they put a bite bar in the mouth and they literally induce a seizure-like activity, all three of which there's excellent evidence can help many forms, not all forms of depression. These are non-drug treatments, which is Amazing, but it's really a shock, literally a shock to the system for rewiring the system. New connections form, and as Jack pointed out, other connections are removed. And then the person feels better. They don't feel depressed. 
But then he said something, this is the first time I've ever heard anyone say this, but I love it because it's coming from you, who's a source, uh, uh, who knows, which is that changing the pattern of breathing, changing your pattern of breathing for the listener is one way of disrupting the ongoing oscillatory activity that's leading to a given emotional state. And I love that because so much of what I see in the breathwork community, which has many wonderful people, is really about, okay, you need to do a four, three, four breath. You need to do a, you know, 30 in breaths and an exhale hold. And we're testing all of these in our lab. But I think we've overlooked perhaps the the more important feature, which is that you're, you're actively and voluntarily changing a behavior, breathing, and that behavior has direct impact on the other oscillations in the brain, including your thought oscillations is essentially how I heard it. So if I said anything that was completely off base or even partially off base, please correct me. If not, we can move on. No, but I, I want to make clear, this is not dogma. We're, we're really speculative right now. Sure. We're trying to do the experiments to right. test these ideas. I mean, that's the way uh, neuroscience progresses. You propose an idea and then yep. you test it. But I think that there's a lot of uh, reason to pursue this because there is emerging evidence from lots of laboratories like yours that are becoming very interested in the role that breathing is playing in higher function and the results seem to be congruent with these ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, my colleague uh, David Spiegel and uh, Associate Chair of Psychiatry at Stanford, he's um, mostly a hypnosis, uh, study hypnosis and other things. But when we talk about breathing, he says, you know, the, the breathing centers in the brainstem that you, your discoveries, how they represent a really interesting bridge between conscious control and unconscious control. There are no other brain areas. I mean, I'm eye movement stuff a little bit, but there are no other brain areas really that represent su such a bridge where you can have immediate voluntary control. I can inhale twice. <sighs> I can do whatever I want with my breath or I can just let it run in the background. It's much harder to do that, say, with my hearing or with my sense of touch. I mean, you can do it, but it, there's a delay there and it takes a lot of conscious effort. Whereas with breathing, you can immediately reach to it. And I think it, um, it's a powerful idea. I'd love your thoughts. Well, but there's something that that is quite surprising about this. And that is breathing is extremely robust. During your lifetime, you'll probably take 600 million breaths. You'll never stop breathing until you stop breathing. And so it's extremely stable. And so it's easy to make things that are extremely stable. I could take a five-ton block of concrete. It's going to be very stable. It's not going to move. But as you point out, I could change breathing like this. Um, and the question is, how do you build something that's extremely stable and yet with the slightest push, you can move it. Mm -hmm. Now with my concrete block, I could put wheels on the bottom of it, but that's a very sophisticated uh, engineering feat to think of na how nature would do that. And we think this is impacting how the, the pre butzinger complex itself is organized so that it meets both of these conditions that it's extremely robust. You don't have to think about it, it's gonna happen. It's going to happen 600 million times, whether you're awake, whether you're asleep, it's going to happen. Um, right. And then, but the thing is, you can change it on a dime. It's not like something like an oil tanker where you need hundreds of you know, meters to, or miles to change it. You change it like that. And so that says something very deep about that structure. Mm. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about how this might be uh, giving us some information about higher processing in the brain. Yeah, I uh, definitely want to talk about higher cognitive processing. I saw a couple papers in the Journal of Neuroscience, which is a fine journal, um, looking at how nasal breathing during uh, memory retention tasks can, in humans can improve memory retention. Whether or not that's related to nasal breathing per se or their cadence of breathing wasn't as clear to me. Um, I have to ask this question because it's in the questions bin that I have access to. I don't know if it shows up on your side, but I'll, I'm just good. I, I have access to it and I get asked this a lot. There is a lore out there, and I realize I might lose a few uh, followers or friends this way, that if I breathe through my left nostril, I'm activating one side of my brain. If I breathe through my right nostril, I'm activating another side of my brain. I know that the nasal passage is to be uh, you know, bilateral to, the, to access to the, the rest of the neocortex and other limbic areas and, and brain. 
is there any evidence? I'm not saying it's not true, but is it, and I'm not trying to debunk anything, but is there any evidence that this right nostril rest left nostril stuff um, has any kind of objective uh, consequence for one neural circuit or another or left brain or right brain? I get asked this all well, the time. Okay. Well, the, the, the gold standard in science is a controlled experiment. And I have not seen a controlled experiment that investigates this. I've read many things, not everything uh, where individuals report that it does have these kinds of effects. But I, you know, as a science, uh, a scientist, you have to be skeptical, but not cynical. So mm -hmm. uh, that's great. I like that. Skeptical, you know, but it, not cynical. So um, I'm a skeptic, but it doesn't mean I th that it's wrong. It's that I don't think it has breached the standard, which I would say that's definitely happening. Okay. Now, there's also the possibility that there's a placebo effect involved, which makes the experiments much more difficult to do. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to teach rodents to slow breathe. And the idea is that we can then test whether or not these slow breathing regimens do have effects on things like fear, anxiety, and panic, because we don't expect uh, rodents to uh, have a placebo effect. Whereas in humans, it's very difficult to disambiguate the suggestive aspects of these kinds of experiments from things that are objective. Yeah, so I love that. It, I love that. that um that uh, experiments on mice done ethically, of course, um, uh, there's no placebo effect. I, I, uh, in all my years of working on rodents, I actually never really, uh, I mean, there's the experimenter bias that you have to be cautious of, but there's no, Absolutely. Uh, there's no placebo effect. Unless the mice are like, I bet you, you gave me the, the small dose. Okay. So, um, all right. So we're talking about right, right nostril, left nostril. The jury is still out. Um, I was trying to think of the control experiment in my mind, I guess. I, anyway, we're, we'll try and not go down that rabbit hole. But, um, thank you for answering that. Because um, I do think it's a question that I get a lot. Um, let, let's just briefly, before we move on, um, someone asked about the, the uh, benefits of nasal breathing there. I would just encourage people to look. There are two sources I think are pretty good on that, um, that are academic sources. The book, uh, they're very good, actually. Jaws, the book by Paul Ehrlich and Sandra Kahn and work by Michael Mew, they're very good, um, describing how nasal breathing can impact the jaws and ability to breathe, especially during development. And then James Nestor's new book, um, Breath, The New Science of a Lost Art, talks a lot about this excellent read, uh, can t talk a lot about why there are benefits of nasal breathing. But there is a case for mouth breathing. There is a case, not, not all the time, but there are times when, for instance, if I'm exercising very hard or I'm, there are forms of breath work, pranayama, holotropic breath work, or, Tumo type breath work that involved doing this. I mean, it's sort of weird to, to breathe on screen, but <sighs> and the consequence of that is to exhale large volumes of carbon dioxide, which then can allow you to do long breath holds, which leads to my question, which is when we do a breath hold, where are the signals to breathe again? So my understanding is that the lungs have baroreceptors, they have pressure receptors, and that if I'm holding my breath, lungs empty or lungs full, it tells my brain, pressure is here, pressure is here, you need to expire, to exhale. Do we, what is the signal from the body to the brain? Probably, it's, it to, to probably it's carbon dioxide. Okay, great. So carbon dioxide builds up and you have these receptors they look like there may be multiple sites, but one of the, uh, there's an area in the parafacial region which we discovered based on work that was done in Germany uh, in the 50s and 60s, that seems to be critical for uh, chemoreception. And okay. so CO2 for carbon dioxide. And there's an interesting um, mutation that, uh, of a gene called FOX2B, P-H-O-X-2B. Has nothing to do with the animal fox. No, it's Oops. pH. It's yeah. PHOX2B. It turns out that there's a, uh, a human uh, genetic disease called central congenital hyperventilation syndrome. I realize that's a mouthful. But basically, these kids don't breathe spontaneously. And you have to catch them at birth. 
And if you catch them at birth, they will breathe when they are awake. They'll do that volitionally. But when they fall asleep, they can stop breathing. And so they have to be intubated and um, they can grow up to uh, adulthood. It yeah. turns out that this is mostly due to a mutation in the FOX2B gene. Um, if you look at the uh, people who can free dive for very long periods of time, they seem to be very tolerant of higher levels of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. And I have a colleague who has speculated that they may be having subliminal degrees of disturbance of this FOX2B gene not sufficient to produce the central congenital hyperventilation syndrome, but enough to make them more insensitive to carbon dioxide. Interesting. So, um, so there are genes that may control our sensitivity to carbon dioxide and breathing patterns. Sounds like there are. Um, and those genes, I'm assuming, are expressed in the neurons that sense carbon dioxide levels and trigger the inhalation reflex. Is that right? Uh, that uh, is basically the accepted idea right now. But okay. There's a, it's a little bit of controversy, but basically I think most people would accept that. Great. Um, skipping around a little bit, but I think there's some important um, topics that you've also done amazing work on. And I'm not being, I'm not just giving Jack all this praise for no reason. We met a few, we met, I think about 10 years ago, I was on an external review panel for a neural circuits um, gathering at UCLA. They brought us up to make sure that they were um, bringing in great stuff and doing great stuff. Of course they were, it's a great place. And, you know, when you think about the neuroscience of breathing, it's, it's Jack, it's not someone else. It's, there are other people, but that, but he's the pioneer in this area. Um, and so I'm going to embarrass him, um, through, with kindness, um, by repeating that. So, all right. So I want to talk about some recent work that, um, you sent me on the relationship between opioids and, breathing skips and why some people might die from taking exogenous opioids, why people die when, when they take too much of these painkillers. Um, uh, opioids, of course, being in the pain relief system, we make them naturally, but people are taking these as so-called opioid crisis. But it turns out there's opioid receptors in some but not all breathing centers, and the pattern of breathing changes when opioids are in the system. Could you familiarize us with the relationship between breathing and these opioid pathways? Sure, but let me take a step backwards. We have to recognize that the nervous system did not evolve to have opiate receptors so that we could be responsive to something derived from, an, from a plant to reduce pain. Okay, so what uh, you're saying just is- That happens it's, to be the- Yeah, so it's- it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's- We have these opioid receptors throughout the brain. They're yeah. not just involved in pain. Right. They're involved in many things, Memory. but they're extremely, when you activate those, in, uh, those receptors and neurons involved in pain, it's very effective in blocking pain. Right. I'm sorry, and Andrew, I, No, uh, no, I, that's important. And, and we're not saying to, you know, if you've been prescribed these medications to stop taking them, it just so happens that there is this opioid crisis where a lot of people who become addicted to these things um, are, are dying. In addition to becoming addicted to them, they have a high overdose potential because um, people, they affect the breathing system. So, um, opioids, are there opioid so, uh, so, receptors in both breathing centers? Okay. So, um, so for whatever reason, we, and we don't understand why there are opioid receptors in structures that are important in the brainstem for breathing. But they're there. We, we discovered them in the pre complex. And when we apply them directly to the pre complex, directly, not systemically, but directly to pre the animals will, we do this in ethically in rodents, the rodents stop breathing. Um, there's another structure that seems to be playing a role, which we haven't discussed yet. And that's in the region of the parabrachial nucleus, not the parafacial, the parabrachial, which is a little bit uh, further up uh, towards the cortex. And it seems that there are opioid receptors there too, and they are also playing a role. Then, so could I ask you a question take... about that? Could I just sure. pause you and say, yeah. so the parabrach when I hear parabrachial nucleus, I think of sort of a generalized alertness signal sent to, maybe not so general, more, more labeled line alertness signal sent to a particular area of the brain, kind of like locus ceruleus can be release norepinephrine and, and wake up a lot of the brain. 
I think a parabrachial nucleus is kind of doing the same thing, but for specific sensory things. Like if I look at something and I'm really interested in it, the parabrach my whole brain wakes up, sure, but the parabrachial nucleus will kind of light up that region in space and make, make my visual acuity and my, the fidelity of my vision better at that location. That's, that's what I know when I think parabrachial nucleus. There's but, a I'm, but I'm a vision scientist, so, you know. So that's how you see things. I get that. Uh, <laughs> I hope uh, you all got that very nerdy <laughs> pun. This is how scientists talk. I'm not. If you if you're thinking about becoming a scientist, this is how this is how we hang out. Where you know. Well, so. usually with a beer or a cocktail in hand, I hope. Sometimes um, I'm not a drinker, but that's because I don't need to drink to to engage in this kind right, of thing. Right. So. Um, the the there's a very strong projection from prebutsa to parabrachial, and parabrachial gets a lot of ascending inputs from uh, sensory systems involved with autonomic and regulatory function. Okay. So there's a it's a way a signaling pathway. It seems to be involved in arousal that people get uh, when they wake up in response to sleep apnea. Uh, so there's lots of things going on. So there's two of these pathways that breathing related signals that then could be very widespread in the brain. That is the locus ceruleus, which is a project that uh, we were fortunate to be invited to work on by Kevin Yackel and Mark Krasnow at Stanford and the parabrachial nucleus. And so these signals are going up there and going everywhere. But with respect to opiates, it seems to be in both places. And we don't know if we block the effects completely on one or the other, we could block opiate-induced depression. We have an unfunded project in our lab right now. We have an idea as to how we might be able to block the respiratory depressive effects of opioids without affecting analgesia. Okay, so um, to translate a little bit, so you've got opioid receptors in in parabrachial nucleus and some other breathing centers. And pre butt singer. And pre butt singer complex. So when someone takes, or in an experimental model, if we we're going to extrapolate from the experiments that you've done, if somebody's, t if opioid levels go too high, these opioids bind to the receptors. And you showed me, I saw a really interesting um, plot where it looked like exhales were, were still happening, but inhales were now skipping. Did I get it exactly backwards? No, you got it exactly correct. And I think we would okay. need a whole hour to sort of go through that for this. Uh, okay. Well, to explain, Instagram. It, but it does seem like, like these opioids are adjusting the normal rhythmic pattern of breathing. It's not just that pe breathing is getting shallower. Like instead of taking deep breaths, you're taking more shallow breaths. It seems like you're missing breaths. People are missing breaths. Well, that, that's an observation that we've made in rats and mice. Uh, we've not taken it into humans yet because of the difficulty of doing these kinds of experiments in humans for, for ethical reasons. Um, we think, I mean, the, the real problem in humans is that they go to doses which instead of producing this intermediate uh, where you get more shallow breathing, you may skip breaths, they just shut it off completely. I see. And when you shut it off completely, five minutes of not breathing can initiate cascades leading to irreversible brain damage. And if it goes much longer than that, then uh, death can result. Okay, great. Um, let's answer a couple quick questions. It's kind of fun to intersperse these. Uh, while I look at these, Jack, someone asked uh, for wine recommendations since you named pre Singer after a bottle of wine. Um, and in full disclosure, I occasionally have a drink. I'm just not, I'm not in the habit of drinking. That's all for Cause I'm getting a little bit of a uh, flack here. Um, but I'm, um, you know, I'm, I think that's fine. Um, so well, I, can you give a wine recommendation? They're asking. Well, I, I, I'm low to sort of give a specific recommendation because I don't really consider myself a true enophile. So but, the answer is no. Oh, wait, you're about uh, to. Wait, okay. but, but, but I would say that we made a mistake in naming, we named the region after the Butzinger wine. And anyone who wants to know about this, I, had an I have an interview online with the BBC. So if you Google Feldman, BBC, size, S-I-G-H-S, mm -hmm. there's a five-minute interview of uh, me explaining how we named it. Okay. But it turns out that the Butzinger wine is a region that has this white wine. It's like a Pinot Grigio. And um, I'm reluctant to say this uh, in an open forum, but it's... Uh, not spectacular. Okay. 
Um, solid, but don't worry. I don't think if they're going to come after anyone, it's going to be me, not you. So that's okay. I'm willing to take on the the, the bot singernistas. Um, so in any event, and I, we, we say this stuff and we do these pauses, folks, because um, it allows some of the information we've been throwing at you to to sink in. And I don't think you'll ever forget now that this region of your brain called the pre-Butzinger complex that was discovered by Jack Feldman, it was named after a bottle of wine because of his decency. Okay. So that, if nothing else, you'll remember that. A couple other questions. Um, oh, well, we still have time, but a little more rapid fire. On, and I realize I'm the one drawing things out. Um, but Psychedelic uh, hallucinations during certain kinds of breathing, holotropic breathing, intense breathing. What, what are your thoughts? I mean, what's going on? Is it shutting down the, the prefrontal cortex? Are you activating a lot of brainstem neuromodulatory centers, getting a lot of dopamine and serotonin release? What, what do you think can explain this? People talk to me about DMT release, but the volume of or the concentrations of DNT in the pineal are very low. Um, what, do, what are your thoughts? Um. I, I to to be candid, I really haven't given very much thought to this. That's ex okay. Except, uh, I would say that when you go to what you might say extreme breathing patterns, you're throwing your physiology into a state that it may not normally be in. You may become there's very little danger in normal breathing of your oxygen levels getting too high, but it very easily can get very low. Mm. And if it gets very low, that will initiate all sorts of metabolic cascades. Uh, same thing with CO2 levels, except CO2 levels will affect your brain state, whether your CO2 levels go up, which would be when you breathe less, or go down when you breathe more. So, if, and, and of course, the breathing will affect all these so-called neuromodulatory systems. So the levels of serotonin, norepinephrine, adenosine, and whatnot mm -hmm. will be affected by this. And so it's not... It's not surprising to me that uh, things that are at sort of at one extreme end of consciousness could be evoked under these uh, rather uh, extensive alterations in body physiology. But I other than making that sort of generic statement, which is sort of waving my hands, I don't really have very much uh, intelligence to say about it. No, that's good. I mean, I've been reading a lot lately. There's some better papers out there, folks, on a lot. Of, I get a lot of questions about psychedelics and um, there are experiments going on. There's a beautiful review published in the journal Cell about psych the new science of psychedelics. And Cell is a legitimate, very rigorous, easily on par with nature and science, um, scientific journal. And they had a beautiful review. It is open access. That review is open access. Um, I highly recommend reading it. Um, and so I think we have a better understanding now of how psychedelics lead to hallucinatory states. It involves the 5-H2C receptor, 5-H2A receptor. And I was wondering if there's any evidence that breathing patterns stimulate or somehow activate the serotonin system if there isn't there that just means it hasn't been looked at yet or it hasn't been discovered but people do report having these like hallucinations and very intense emotional states sometimes um that border on hallucinatory um in respira intense respiration practices okay so when we talk about serotonin there's a phenomena called uh, long-term facilitation so if i um elevate or uh, lower the oc your oxygen levels for let's say five minutes so you're still breathing but your oxygen levels are lower so your breathing goes up for five minutes and then i restore normal oxygen levels the breathing level comes back down to normal however if i do it three minutes hypoxia low oxygen i come back down to normal oxygen i repeat that and i repeat that three times what happens is instead of coming back to your normal level, over a period of about an hour or more, your breathing level stain is very high for hours afterwards. There's a term called long-term facilitation, and there's a uh, very large uh, unit at the University of Florida led by, led by Gordon Mitchell that is demonstrating that long-term facilitation seems to have all sorts of effect on body function. Um, and they're looking at it for things like spinal cord injury and repairing spinal cord injury because it seems to cause the release of uh, certain neurochemicals, including serotonin levels go up. And then there's the um, a factor called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, 
which also seems to be go, go up when there's this altered breathing pattern. Now, this is not a volitionally altered breathing pattern. This is a breathing pattern which is altered by giving a uh, change in the blood gases, and mm -hmm. it's called intermittent hypoxia. And that intermittent may turn hypoxia. out to be... Yeah, that may, or episodic hypoxia. Mm -hmm. That may turn out, if done properly, to be something that's therapeutic. Uh, there are reports that cognitive function improves mm -hmm. after several bouts of intermittent mm -hmm. hypoxia, and mm -hmm. physical performance is uh, mm -hmm. improved. In fact, Gordon and I have discussed doing an experiment to see whether or not it improves our golf games. <laughs> because that's where, because if it does, that's where the real money is. So, oh my! You know, now, again, that, that, was si that was science humor, by the way, folks. Just making clear. Um, so this is really interesting. Um, there are certain um, states of oxygen to carbon dioxide ratios in the system. I hear you saying that can activate uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, you talk about uh, long-term facilitation. Or um, this is a different than it's talked about it like LTP. It's, I see. It's so different than neuroplasticity. I see. Neuro so it's a well, so it may involve. It does seem to involve neuroplasticity, but it's not the same thing. It just happened to be okay. using the same the similar term. Okay, so this is interesting. So, folks, I know uh, there are a lot of people who are interested in like what's the specific pattern of breathing I should do to get blank. And I think what you're hearing today is some. First of all, um, it's clear that. Breathing patterns impact the neural activity in many places in the brain and body that interrupting the pattern that you didn't like, what Jack beautifully described as the rut, by changing your breathing pattern is one route to disrupting whatever pattern to get into a new pattern of brain state. Whether or not the specific pattern of breathing matters or not is something that my lab and his lab are working very actively on. I, um, in fact, we're mainly just taking Jack's findings and, and, tra and exporting them to humans as much as we can through discussion and through reading his papers. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to collaborate at some point. And I'm sure we will. Um, and it seems that based on the carbon dioxide oxygen ratios that are induced by different patterns of breathing, there's an opportunity, although we don't know which specific pattern of breathing would do this, that could induce heightened levels of things like brain derived neurotrophic factor might have a, a, a therapeutic effect, maybe after traumatic brain injury or concussion. There is a, a, some interesting data I've seen from Ron Frostig's lab that like after stroke um, increases, a lot of people thought, oh, you want to rest uh, um, after a brain injury. And of course you want to talk to a neurologist folks, this isn't medical advice, but he's found that if he kept perfusion to the brain higher by way of more activity and respiration, then there was quicker recovery from the stroke infarct because um, from, the, from the damage site. Um, we need some doctor. There are, people are always putting up comments. When these stream by, um, it's very hard to catch them all, although I catch Tony Blower. Well, I did see someone eyes. saying I should mention Erica Dale. Hi, Erica. <laughs> Erica Dale's great. She's working in Gordon Mitchell's group and has made some important contributions to this LTF literature. So I give her a shout out. Yeah. Yeah. So of, of course we can't credit everyone. We are winding down here. We have a few more minutes. So I want to make sure that we cover. Um, let, uh, let me, can I, yeah. I just make one comment because Please. We've, we've sort of focused on the effects of breathing in other states. And I just want to emphasize that there are many ways that, that breathing related signals can get into the brain. Uh, one is by just the change in the pattern coming from the pre complex or the parafacial or the parabrachial going up to all parts of the brain. We could have a, this descending influence because when you breathe slower, you are issuing a volitional command that may radiate throughout your brain and it may be coming from there. It may be coming from the olfactory oscillations with breathing that changes. So instead of having the normal rate at which air is flowing in and out, you now change it, that could have an effect. It could be coming in from the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a nerve that goes through all of your visceral organs. It innervates the lung, it innervates the stomach, it innervates the intestine. And we know that stimulation of the vagus nerve can have profound effects on uh, depression. And so that's another way because every time you inflate and deflate your lungs with breathing, you're producing an oscillatory signal in your vagus. So yeah. there are many different ways could be coming in. And it could be that different patterns are emphasizing one pathway or another. But I think ultimately 
the, the first order, the effect is that disrupting this breathing related signal. To second order, the specifics may turn out to be very important, but as far as understanding the mechanism right now, we're not there yet. And I think if someone wants to get benefit, I'm not a doctor and I would just say, find something you're comfortable with and give it a shot. Yeah, great. Um, Jack, do you uh, have a breathwork practice? I, 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 I was very skeptical about all this until I uh, took a course in mindfulness at UCLA just to learn how to meditate. And they had two goals. One was to see whether or not breathing would affect my conscious state or emotional state. And the other was to see if I could levitate because that's what I grew up with. <laughs> People who were monks could, Zen monks could levitate. Well, I still haven't levitated, but I do uh, try and meditate, go someplace quiet for at least 10 minutes a day. Very often I'll do it at so-called lunch hour and uh, I'll just close my office door and uh, just be quiet. And, and that really restores my energy levels. Mm -hmm. um, so and Jack has a lot of energy, folks. So if you need more energy <laughs> to be like Jack, the um, one thing I, you know, people, uh, I got some questions about the relationship between breathing and heart and the pulmonary system. Just really briefly, we're, I'll do a whole post on this later. And Jack will come back again. I, I'm, I'm agreeing for him to come back again. Um, we have a little <laughs> bit of time. But, um, you know, when you exhale, the diaphragm moves up, essentially, the heart gets a little smaller, it gets a little compacted, actually. And as a consequence, because of the way that blood flow changes, there's a parasympathetic or calming signal that's sent into the nervous system, um, out from the nervous system. When you exhale, right, the diaphragm, uh, excuse me, you inhale, the diaphragm moves down. When you inhale, the diaphragm moves down, the heart expands, there's less blood pumping through the, the, the heart, and then there's the sympathetic signal. So it act, it's more of an alertness signal. This is the basis of heart rate variability. This is how breathing and heart rate variability interact. So when you hear about HRV and heart math and all this stuff, you're really talking about respiration impacting the heart, impacting the sympathetic to parasympathetic ratio. And, and I have to say, Jack, that you know, the relationship between all the, the blood gases and carbon dioxide and oxygen has been something that's been out there a lot. I think the work of Patrick McEwen is great. There's great stuff out there. Jack, you, you've really gotten me to think over the last five, 10 years uh, really deeply about these structures in the brain and how these circuits are controlling it. In the last, we got a, a few more minutes, but then Instagram will kick us off at um, probably mid-sentence, mid-breath. Is there anything else that um, you'd like people to know? If nothing comes to mind, if you want to talk about nitric oxide, uh, um, if you want to talk about nasal versus mouth breathing, anything, or we could simply close out. Don't feel any pressure. We'll have I, you back. I, I'm, a, I'm reluctant to sort of start something I can't finish. I, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity, and oh. I'd be uh, delighted to do this again, particularly following up in areas that your, uh, the audience might uh, uh, be curious about. Great. Well, we will pay attention to the questions, and we'll read through them. I, I do read all the questions. I try and collapse them into common questions, ones that get a lot of, um, you know, that are repeatedly asked. I know we went into science. We talked about pre Singer, parafacial, parabrachial, vagus, uh, BDNF, depression. I love the idea that changing your breathing pattern is akin in, in concept to things like electric shock therapy and things that are just are designed to disrupt the pattern, but that you have voluntary control. Those were Jack's words, not mine. I really want to be clear. Um, I'm not just saying that because he's here. It's really important that we credit the people who say these things and do these things, not for sake of egos, but just to make sure that the message doesn't get contorted and distorted over time. And Jack, thanks so much for coming on. I'm definitely going to invite you uh, back and I hope you'll say yes. I know you probably have a lot of new fans. Jack does have an Instagram account. Maybe he'll start posting more there. Um, it's easy. It's Jack L. Feldman. Is that correct? It's one, one word, Jack L. Feldman. I have to say I've been using it mostly for posting pictures of my grandkids. But well, I think if there's a reason, I'll post. Or maybe I'll create a separate account for things that might be breath-related that people would find interesting. Great. No pressure to do that. But if you do decide to do that, let me know. And then I'll let, let um, everybody I can get to know. Um, meanwhile, this will be – this was recorded. We – 
Uh, we will repost it as a standard feed on my Instagram site. So you'll see like half my head and half Jack's head in a picture. Click on that. You can watch the whole hour. You could take notes. You could um, write down questions for the next time. Jack, I know you're very busy. I know there are fires in the state of California. There's a <laughs> pandemic. We run research labs. We have grants and papers and graduate students. Thanks so much for your time. Um, you've been very gracious. I really well, appreciate you. Well, I think what you're doing here, Andrew, is very important. We, do, we tend to live in our ivory towers. And I think that there is real benefit in communicating to people. And it's amazing how many people are actually interested in, in what we do. And we just have to make an effort to go out there and explain it to them and get their feedback. I mean, quite frankly, they're paying for it. They deserve to know. And I appreciate this opportunity to do this. And I uh, hope I, we can continue it. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Oh, I would love to have you back. Thanks so much, Jack. Thank you. Thank Jack, okay. everybody. Follow him on Instagram if you like. And thank him in your minds and hearts and breaths. That's my best <laughs> attempt at a media sign-off. I've never done that before. Take Please care. I'll, talk to, you. I'll okay. talk to you soon, Jack. Take care. Bye now.